Coming up on this episode of The Social Hour, we are chatting with Leo Siegel. He's the co-founder of Prizio. They are revolutionizing the charitable acts of the world. It's going to be really cool. Plus, a service called Flatter wants you to pay for liking stuff on social networks. What? How does that work? I'll tell you about that. And can Zynga save draw something? I don't know. All that and the smartwatch race is on. Up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Bandwidth for the Social Hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is The Social Hour with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur, episode 103, recorded Friday, March 22nd, 2013. This episode of The Social Hour is brought to you by 99designs, the world's largest online graphic design marketplace. 99designs connects businesses seeking quality, affordable designs with a community of 200,000 graphic designers. Visit 99designs.com slash social hour to receive a free design consultation. That's 99designs.com slash social hour. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting edition of The Social Hour. Happy March 22nd, everyone, from Twit World Headquarters in Petaluma, California. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm doing very well, Amber. You're looking very bright and sunny today. You know, I'm trying to pretend it's spring because apparently uh, in Toronto it is still winter and it's been snowing. We've had flurries over the past few days and uh, I'm just moving into spring, Sarah. I don't care what the weather is like outside. I am ready for spring and warm weather. So uh, I'm just going with it. It's all in my head now. It's wonderful. You're Florida on the inside. I am. It's true. That is a very good point. I have Florida on the inside and I'm ignoring all of this awful weather. So, uh, you know, it'll be heating up soon enough. But uh, yeah, things are great. It's been a, a, a good week for me here in Toronto and uh, really excited because we have a guest on the show that was actually recommended by Alexis Ohanian, who we've had on uh, a couple of times now. And uh, he recommended we have uh, someone from Prizio, uh, Leo, one of the co-founders on The Social Hour. In fact, uh, he's with us now. Leo Siegel, welcome to the Social Hour. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. So uh, Amber, uh, you came uh, very uh, uh, well recommended from, as Amber said, uh, Alexis, who's a friend of the show, and he knows a thing or two about social stuff. So uh, for anybody who's yeah. not familiar with Prizio, what's going on? What, what, what do you guys do? So we basically built a new charitable fundraising platform for celebrities and influencers. And uh, our unique hook is that we run, we basically offer one of a kind money can't buy prize experiences to the public. So kind of like raffles, basically, but a lot more sophisticated from a tech perspective. So, for example, I was at a charity event last night and there were a variety of of, uh, you know, it is kind of cool things that were being given away. You know, win a, win a private dinner at this restaurant, you know, if you pay a certain amount of money. Is it, is it something, is it sort of like that, but just set up uh, online to make it easier for people to participate? So actually, um, the idea for Prizio stemmed from the team actually organizing these charity events, the kind of events that you're talking about. Uh, while we were at Oxford University a couple of years ago, we founded a philanthropic society that basically threw large-scale charity fundraising gala events uh, for charity. We raised over a million dollars doing these, and we had some amazing pretty prizes at these auctions. But what we found was extremely limiting about these auctions is that only those in the room rich enough to bid for these prizes could get involved and donate. And we felt that that left a lot of money on the table because when you're dealing with huge celebrities, they come with fan bases. And now if you're putting the celebrity in this room of just a few rich people, you're not tapping into their fan base at all. And that leaves a ton of money on the table. So we thought, why don't we actually flip the auction model completely on its head? 
turn it into more of a raffle structure whereby anyone can enter for a chance to win for just three dollars and then we can basically capture all of the fans donations and in turn raise a lot more money and a lot more awareness for the causes at hand it's kind of interesting you know in some ways it reminds me a bit of almost a a mashup between crowdfunding micro payments and something like change.org it's like they all got together and they had a baby and it's Prizio. So uh, the idea that it's almost like crowdfunding for a cause. And I, I think it's, you know, it's genius. It makes perfect sense. One of the questions I have about the service is that you have an amazing list of celebrities on board. How are you able to get all of those people to participate in what is a relatively new service? Um, so really, I mean, it's a combination of different things. But really, I think we really sell people on the concept. And basically, through the from everyone we've spoken to, we basically have gotten the impression that people think that it's really a no-brainer. So on the celebrity side, celebrities are often trying to find, you know, innovative ways to engage their fan bases in fundraising. But, you know, usually they just resort to, you know, tweeting out saying, everyone, please donate. And really, they're not incentivizing people. So we basically give them the chance to really incentivize their fan base to actually take notice of their fundraising charitable activities. Um, on On the charity side, it's even more obvious because for the charities, we basically pitch to them that we are the best platform that they could use to be utilizing their celebrity ambassadors and leveraging the celebrities' fan bases for their own benefit to raise Uh, more money and more awareness for their cause. So often the charities will go to celebrities and suggest to the celebrity that they should try out our platform for the charity's benefit. And, you know, often um, celebrities, especially if it's a charity that that they strongly support, will listen to their marketing teams about what they think would be like a great option for them. How long have you been working on Prizio? Because when I... In a way, my first reaction is, oh, it's almost like Kickstarter, but you don't have to convince everybody that, that, you know, that that the organization is cool. I mean, everyone knows that Jamie Oliver is an amazing chef, so that's something I'd want to be participating in. And, you know, adding a little bit of money from a lot of people ends up being really effective. Is is, is Kickstarter something that you, you, you modeled yourselves after? So it's funny you say that because actually it's not at all something we modeled ourselves on initially. Initially for our for our UK beta tests, um, we didn't kind of have any of the Kickstarter style levels of entry. We just had how many tickets do you want to buy? And now actually Jamie is the first um, campaign that it's our first international campaign anyway, but it's the first campaign that we've really tried out the different incentives for different levels and actually our average donation has absolutely skyrocketed wow and actually one of you know when you're at y combinator everything is moving a million miles an hour you find some inspiration you you know stay up all night coding it and actually one of our huge inspirations for for going slightly more down the kickstarter route with our campaigns is that veronica mars campaign that was going viral a couple of weeks ago Mm -hmm. on kickstarter We were so inspired by how, you know, when Kristen Bell was offering for like a sign something in return for a chunk of money that wasn't even a charitable donation, people were absolutely lapping it up. So exactly like you say, when it's a good cause involved and you're offering an extra guaranteed incentive on top of the chances to win a prize, then it's it's like a complete no-brainer to enter. And our average donation for this Jamie campaign right now has absolutely skyrocketed. I know, I know you answer this in your FAQs, but uh, could you talk a little bit about how you choose the winner? Because I'm sure people are wondering, wondering about that process. If they do donate money, how yeah. you actually end up picking someone. So although we're not gambling uh, because we have a free entry route, so that's, it's not a lottery, we decided that to, you know, be extra, extra, extra legitimate and fair, we would code a random number generator that meets uh, UK government standards for lotteries. So it's a government certified random number generator. So, Very cool. So Leo, how many people are, are on the team? Um, so at the moment, we're a team of, of eight. 
Okay, so it's it's a small team. Is this something you know? Is 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 chair is is the concept of charity something that 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 started the initiative, or are you just a group of geeks and said we 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 need to f figure out a problem that needs to be solved and 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 sort of decided to build a service from the ground up? I mean, where was the where was the initial incentive? So. Actually, it's a complete intersection of both. I think on the one hand, we were organizing these charity events and we just spotted a ridiculously large inefficiency. For example, we would raise like, you know, $250,000 for an event. But for the earlier ones, we were spending 100,000 to put it on and five months of organization. So that was just us and that was students. And, you know, we weren't being paid for that. But charities are actually spending resources on organizing those kind of events. And what's really interesting um, and what I feel is, is quite a strong validation for the concept is that Jamie Oliver actually put off his annual May fundraiser for Food Revolution Day to focus purely on having a Prizio campaign as his fundraising call to action. And then on the other side of that, you know, we are three geeks. We, you know, we've always wanted to do something huge and obviously internet based. So basically we, we were solving our own problem and we just saw this magical opportunity to take something that we saw was so inefficient and, you know, put tech behind it to create this scalable platform that can serve like every celebrity in the world, basically. Now, there are lots of different social elements to what you guys have built, but one of the things I find the most interesting is this idea of uh, uh, picking a friend. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I really love pick a friend, basically, because it it basically makes this whole thing a social activity. Because, you know, traditionally entering competitions or contests is, you know, it's quite a selfish closeted thing you know it's not the kind of thing that that you tell people that you're doing and and really secretly inside you're just desperate to win now what i love about pick a friend is it really does make it a social thing so you know if there's a singing lesson with your favorite celebrity and and you know you know you have friends that like that singer too then obviously you're going to want to pick them for a chance to come to that with you and basically, it allows you to have fun and, and a joke with, with your friends and almost forget about the fact that actually you might win this prize because together you're imagining, what if we win this prize? And then obviously, you know, supporting the cause makes it extra relevant to share with your friends. Now, I know that the, the Prizio model is that uh, Prizio keeps a 10% um, of, of the proceeds and charities receive 90% of of prizes revenue you do make a mention that that number might reduce in time as you yeah. explore additional possible revenue streams what might those revenue streams be so at the moment um we're really hot on brands we've been meeting a ton of brands during the um during our time in y combinator we've actually taken on a fantastic advisor called michael lynch who until recently was the head of global sponsorship for visa who's been helping us a lot with formulating our brand strategy and basically, as far as brands are concerned, um, from the talks that we've had, it seems like our campaigns, um, especially as we kind of get going and gain more and more traction, are the perfect platform for brands to engage in cause-based marketing and corporate social responsibility. And so brands will not only match donations for a campaign, but they'll also pay us a marketing fee. And as soon as we can really go down that route, then it means that, you know, the percentage that we take from charities is less and less important to us and we can reduce it over time. It's fabulous. You know, I was just speaking at an event a couple of days ago and someone in the audience was talking about how worried they were about the the future generation who's so comfortable with the internet, maybe spending too much time on social media sites. And I feel as though services that are being built like this are the exact reason why the internet is such an amazing platform. So uh, very cool service. Uh, my last question for me is uh, yeah. if uh, the average person wants to get involved, maybe you're not a big time celebrity, maybe you're not a brand. I mean, do you see rolling out that capabilities to capability to an individual maybe who has a social media following? How would that work? Someone like you definitely could, <laughs> could chat on our platform soon. Sarah and um, I, have, we should do something, Sarah. Yeah, dinner yeah. with us. Somebody made a joke in chat, uh, in our chat room. Uh, you know, we could have dinner with us. Yeah, yeah definitely. Sure.
Yeah. Well, we've actually we've actually convinced Paul Graham um, from Y Combinator to do um, to do a prize too, and he has roughly the same social following as Amber, actually. So at, at the beginning, we're really concentrating on, you know, big A-list celebrities that have huge fan bases that they can leverage. So um, although we can't announce names yet, we have some big Grammy Award winners and, you know, really, really huge celebrities coming up. Um, later on, when we kind of amass a huge, hopefully, following in our own right, then we're going to cross-promote all of our campaigns and basically offer a platform to anyone that, you know, could be in the public interest. So it doesn't necessarily need to be someone that already has a huge following, but just someone that, you know, would be of interest um, and that may not be able to spread the word of their own campaign wide enough to raise tens and tens of thousands of dollars, but it still would be of interest to tens and tens of thousands of people. Very cool. I it's love such it. Awesome yeah, this is, this is wonderful. Prizio, um, and as you told us before the show, not not Prizio. Uh, so yeah. people can go to <laughs> Prizio at P-R-I-Z-E-O dot com. And your current campaign is the Jamie Oliver campaign, right? So uh, forward slash yeah. Jamie. Yeah, forward slash Jamie. Well, Leo Siegel, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, indeed, great service. It really, Thanks. truly Thanks. makes sense. And congratulations for thinking of it before anybody else did. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much you so for having much. you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Have a great weekend. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye Leo. Bye, Leo. Bye. Another Leo. Ah, it always feels good. Uh, quick reminder <laughs> uh, that uh, we record the social hour. Sometimes we have guests like today. Sometimes it's just me and Amber having kind of like a little virtual dinner chat uh, on Fridays at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. And if you ever want to follow up on some of the, uh, the you know the, the websites that our guests are plugging or or stories that we cover, we have all of our links at twit.tv slash TSH. Not only links, but we have all of our past show episodes, videos, all that good stuff. Links to subscribe. It is all there at twit.tv slash TSH. Well, Amber, we've got quite a bit of news to get through on this show, of course, because it's another one of those. March has just been crazy. It's like it's like the social month. Uh, but before we do, we want to quickly thank 99designs for sponsoring this episode of the social hour. What's so great about 99 designs is there are all these great graphic designers out there. Well, I don't necessarily know how to get a hold of them. You know, maybe I run across a website or two online, but it's not as if I have this place to go to see a lot of high quality designers uh, that, you know, there are a lot of variety that's also affordable. Affordable is the key here because there are some great graphic designers out there and I wish I could afford them for my personal projects. So here's how it works. You tell 99designs what you're looking for. You know, do you need a logo made? Do you need a, hey, do you need a whole splash page? What is it that you need? And then designers from their community will submit designs that are created for you. You give the designers feedback. They kind of go back and, and do a little tweak, but, you know, based on your instructions. And then you select and pay for the favorite. So you know, it's just people sort of vying, vying for 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 your work. So 99 Designs provides more than 210,000 graphic designers worldwide. So we got a lot of designers here. You're going to get a lot of variety. World-class customer support all day, every day. That's 24-7 over phone, email, and chat. Design consultations that are completely free, complimentary in San Francisco. They've got the design team for all your branding needs. Um, and 100% money back guarantee. So if you end up not being happy with with, with with how it all turned out, you don't have to worry about not getting your money back. You know, this is this is important stuff. And 99designs wants y'all to be happy. We got logo design, web design. Uh, they do landing pages. What about Facebook cover designs, banner ads? I mean, anything that you can think of. Menus, greeting cards. This is all, you know, this is affordable pricing too. Apparel design like t-shirts and hoodies and that kind of stuff. Mobile app design. So you can start right now for as low as $199 for your own custom graphic design. That's, that's, that's pretty good for something that's going to be really, really professional. Go to 99designs.com slash social hour, and you can get a $99 power pack of services for free. That's $100 
for free. A power pack gives you more designer time and attention. You get it. There's a, a little bit more back and forth. 99 Designs will bold and highlight and feature your design project in their marketplace. So you get some exposure as well and you'll get nearly twice as many designs. You can also call 800-513-1678. That's designated just for you, the TWIT audience. That's 800-513-1678. I'll say it just one more time because you were fumbling around for a pencil. 1-800-513-1678. So thanks to 99designs, and again, that's 99designs.com slash social hour. And thanks to them for sponsoring us. So Amber, uh, remember when Zynga bought um, OMG Pop, which was the company that made Draw Something, which was the really, really, really hot app a few months, gosh, it was probably almost a year ago now, and it kind of went up and then quickly, quickly uh, the excitement fell off, kind of right after yeah. they bought them. I definitely remember that. And you know, it's funny, I, I follow Ryan Seacrest on Twitter. So I saw this tweet that he did send out recently talking about Draw Something 2. So it looks like uh, Ryan Seacrest was uh, leaking Draw Something 2. I'm sure that uh, this was all well planned. But uh -huh. uh, there will be a new version which will have many more social features based on this article that uh, is on TechCrunch. Yeah, it's it's interesting, uh, and and I'm not going to judge you for following Ryan Seacrest on Twitter, <laughs> Amber, because I'm sure he's a very interesting person. He is, of course. He, of course. Well, you know, it's hard not to like him, right? I mean, I know he does so much. I'm just, you know what? Sorry, just as a little aside, I'm amazed at all of the things he does. So it's like, it, you know, he has American Idol, he has his radio show, he has his production company. So I feel as though uh, I'm kind of like, you know, where's Ryan? It's like a where's Waldo kind type of thing. Anyway, that's a whole other. Topic. I have, I'm convinced. I've thought a lot about this. I think that he has clones uh, because there's just no way that anybody is that busy and, and so cheerful all the time. I, I there's got to be more. He's, he's at least a twin, maybe a triplet. Uh, so yeah, the, so this is kind of interesting. So the, the thing with Draw Something, and, and many of you have played it or played it, but if for some reason you just have no idea what the concept is, the idea is, is that I'm given a word uh, on a mobile device or a tablet or something, and I'm supposed to draw that um, and send to Amber, and Amber's supposed to figure out what I drew. And the the hilarity of it, and it really was fun, yeah, the first few times I played, because so many of us are not good artists. Or you can sort of creatively draw something and see if somebody could get like the phrase in a roundabout sort of a way. So the problem, and, and, and what Zynga had noticed, is that the, the problem is that you know, in the in the cases where somebody puts quite a bit of effort into their design, you know, it gets sent. If I if I'm really really sort of proud of what I drew, you know, it's a beautiful cityscape or something, and I send it to Amber, and Amber guesses it right, the drawing is sort of gone. It 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 just exists for her, and it's um it doesn't it doesn't stay anywhere. It doesn't last forever. And I think that uh, that that's possibly something that people yeah it's it, it didn't didn't really retain much. Um, and what uh, it sounds like they're doing is they're having the best artist accumulating followings inside the game, and then the content will become a place where you can keep your drawings and show them off, you know, based on accolades that you get from the community and be, you know, you could sort of be known as a better designer and people could potentially want to play you specifically or, 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 or get a drawing from you specifically, which, uh, yes, as the TechCrunch article about this notes, it makes the game, as they say, stickier, meaning that mm -hmm. you, you, you kind of stay for longer, you have more an incentive to, to, to put more effort into it. And then it gets Zynga into sort of genres that are more creative than some, you know, other Zynga games. Uh, Zynga's had some some kind of bad, like Farmville 2 is okay, uh, but Cityville 2, Mafia Wars 2, those are, those are uh, sequels to franchises that were initially wildly successful and people are just kind of like meh about it. Amber, when you hear about trying to tweak draw something to to get people back into it does it sound like this is a good idea is anyone going to notice I don't know. I feel like it's a little bit like movie sequels. You know, everybody's a little bit hesitant about uh, jumping on board and uh, there are very few that actually succeed. So I worry somewhat about this approach, although I do think the idea of making it stickier because the images are, are there longer, I think that kind of does make some sense. So there's more longevity to the game. However, I don't think they're ever going to see that initial uh, craze again that they had when they first launched the game. And in some ways, I just I feel like, uh, you know, they may have uh, high expectations, but they may not be realized 
necessarily. So uh, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure if it's going to be a huge hit, Sarah. I, 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 nothing ever really looks, when I look at Zynga in general, um, and it's not just draw something, but just, just the kind of the landscape of this huge company that's employing so many people and, and mm. relying on these viral games that are played primarily on mobile devices. The future doesn't look that sunny to me. And yeah. Yeah, maybe the, the people who are working there will figure out the secret sauce and we'll all come flocking back to a game that was fun for five minutes. But I have my doubts. I really do. Yeah, I do too. Uh, now, here is another service, and this idea has been around for a while. It's called uh, Flatter, and uh, based on this article on the next web, it is kind of like an online tip jar. You basically put money into your account, and then based on uh, things that you like and favorite on services like Twitter, for example, you could be giving them tiny little micro donations. So people who produce content could have a chance to potentially make a little bit of money if they be participate and become part of this. So. Uh, uh, I, uh, Sarah, I'm really interested to hear your view on this because it reminds me of the early days of having a tip jar on uh, different podcast sites. Yeah, so uh, the the way, you know, as, as Amber mentioned, you sign up for Flatter and then you say, oh, I, you know, maybe once a month I would like to, you know, I can part with $20, let's say. Um, that's, what, that's what I'll go ahead and donate um, each month. So you basically, you add, you, 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 you load up your account at Flatter with, with, with the $20. Uh, and then you link up your social networks, the accounts you have on social services, uh, like Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud, Flickr, GitHub, App.net. I mean, they've, they've got quite a few partners. Facebook isn't supported yet. Then at the end of each month, your monthly donation is divided up between everyone you've liked, and Flatter takes a 10% cut. Okay, so how do they know that you liked them? That's um, liking or favoriting on Twitter. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing, but you know, it's the little star button or Instagram, or it's basically you know I'm thumbsing up stuff around the net. Amber, I love this idea. However, I feel like it would change the way that I use the internet uh, in a big way, particularly on Twitter, because I favorite things that I see because I want to come back to them later. So when I look at my list of favorites, it's all sort of like. Oh, I don't know, somebody mentioned an iPhone app that I want to follow up on later or an article that I think might be good for the social hour. So I, you know, that's not really the point of this. The point of this is if I really, really, really thought your, 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 your the, you know, the next tweet that you send, Amber, is just the most, it's, it's the funniest tweet or, or it's so poignant or it was the best link you've ever shared, that would be the reason that I would favorite it. So it's really kind of like an incentive to not go crazy online, uh, you know, clicking every like button you see, but thinking really hard about, is this actually adding value to my life and the internet in general? And I kind of like that. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's a neat concept. The only thing that I would say is that you do have competition out there from services. We just uh, had someone on from Prizio, for example, right. where there are services where you can give micro donations to people who you know are potentially really in need. So that's my only issue. And I'm not saying that content creators aren't in need. Uh, I know some of them, I'm sure, would appreciate a few extra dollars. But I think when you're competing with causes on the internet, all of a sudden it becomes a, a, a bit of a difficult battle in some ways because it would make more sense to give money to maybe microfinancing services where you can help someone overseas or or a certain charity nearby or whatever that might be. So that's the only part to me is like, if I'm going to do something like this, as far as micropayments online, I'm more inclined to go the donation route to causes. Yeah, I, 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 I see your point. It's This really reminds me of, do you watch the show Girls, Amber, on HBO? I have never seen it. I'm like the only person in the world who has not seen it. Well, I'm sure that's not true, but there's a... There's a it feels like it. There's a fictional app that's part of a storyline in the show where uh, a guy has created an app that will charge you if you contact your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend. So you sign <laughs> up and basically you're like, okay, if I'm going to make that phone call, I got to pay $10 each time. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's a ha-ha right. thing. It doesn't actually exist. But it's something that we all go, yeah, it's not too far off. And in a way, I almost feel like something like Flatter is almost designed to 
penalize you, penalize you for overdoing it online. It's not so much that these content creators need a, a few pennies here and there. It's that it's supposed to keep you from just liking everything, you know, and, sh and oversharing and, and contributing to noise that maybe you shouldn't contribute to. You know, think really hard. Do I really like this that much? How important is this to me? So maybe a, a little bit more of like a behavior change. Yeah, it's almost like with Flatter, I feel like it's almost there, but not quite, you know, like it needs a little tweak or something, you know, something's not a hundred percent for me as far as uh, seeing the success of this company. So uh, we'll keep an eye on them, see what happens and uh, see, uh, you know, what others say about them. Let us know what you think of them because uh, I feel like it's close, but uh, maybe a, a, a bit of improving improvement to uh, be done there. Agreed. Uh, Amber, our favorite social network Pinterest has gotten a bit of an update um, and I actually, it's great, um, even though I don't use Pinterest all that often, um, I've got, uh, we can sort of look at a little before and afterwards on, on my computer here because I've got the Pinterest layout that I'm pretty happy with. But then up at the top, it says coming in a few weeks, everybody on Pinterest will see our new look. Would you like to get it now? Okay, I'll go ahead and say yes. Let's switch on over. What's it going to look like? It looks, <laughs> it looks, well the same sort of I guess the 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 the, uh, the boxes the images are a little bit bigger but it, yeah it, it kind of looks, of looks like the Pinterest. same Mm -hmm. I guess that's good, though. I mean, they've had so much success with Pinterest and many people have copied that design. I see the Pinterest looking sites all over the place on the web. But, uh, you know, they just kind of tweaked it a little bit here and there, I guess. Uh, I don't use it enough to notice any dramatic changes. But again, I go back to that idea that maybe that's a good thing. You know, they know what they're doing. They have a very captive audience and people love the service who use it, not unlike me. Yeah, I know. It's weird. I'm looking at all the stuff. I'm like, when did I become so obsessed with jewelry? And I don't quite remember. I guess I was in a mood one day. Some of the stuff is interesting. Crazy cat lady. Oh man, I like that. I have to have <laughs> it. Wow. I should have, I'm liking this. Is that a t-shirt? It's a sweatshirt. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> Crazy cat lady. Oh, that's cute, Sarah. That's great. I love it. I have to have it. <laughs> here, I, here I am making, oh, of course it's at fab.com. It's perfect. I've got a little, uh, I've got a credit at Fab. This is, well, now I know what I'm wearing to the charity <laughs> okay, event. Okay, you can't shop Next. on the show. We have to focus. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, fine. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a step back. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, this is, this is, it's, it's Pinterest is wildly popular. Uh, they've made a little design tweak. It's not really all that crazy different. Uh, it sounds like that not only have they changed their designs um, a little bit, but there are some more discovery features um, as far as what's pinned and, and, and how you can search for a certain topic or not topic, but a certain certain category, like a crazy cat lady shirt, that sort of thing. But uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's always nice to uh, check in on Pinterest every so often. And I will not buy that sweatshirt, but I will keep that tab open for later on in the <laughs> day when we're not actually live on the air. Good plan. No, you know, it's a good job when you can actually, uh, you know, chop a little bit while you're doing work. Uh, okay, so uh, interesting headline that I know you've put into our rundown here about mobile chat apps uh, that they've overtaken Twitter and Facebook in Japan and Korea. Uh, I don't find this to be too big of a surprise, but uh, I wonder if it's a sign of what things to come in uh, our part of the world in terms of uh, especially a younger generation uh, really, you know, not necessarily sticking to Facebook as much as they did at one point and appreciating uh, uh, messaging apps that much more. Yeah, I think this is um, I think this is fascinating stuff. I mean, we we talk so much about. I mean, Facebook is the most obvious uh, uh, example of. It's the huge social network, right? It's the one where uh, you know we've got a billion people on Earth that are using Facebook. So many of the world's people have Facebook accounts, and so it seems like well, that's the one, right? And but nothing really lasts, and especially in the social age, we find that things just ebb and flow and people get interested in other social networks and, and we hear all the time about Facebook not necessarily being the end all social network that does, that does it all. We've got We Are Social that's based in Singapore. There's a, net, a social network called Line out of Japan, Kako Talk out of Korea, and they have so many millions of users. I mean, uh, Line has 36 million users, 19 million uh, for Kakao Talk in Korea, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, as far as China, QZone uh, is in the lead. WeChat is another one. It, a lot of the stuff, you know, I'm throwing it out. It's like, what? I don't know. I, 
I've never seen any of these social networks. You know, I, we're, we're hearing about them now. But the thing is that they're originating. I mean, Facebook originated not too far from where I'm sitting right now, just a you know, couple hours south in California. And there's that whole Silicon Valley thing. But there are these social networks that are gaining mass popularity in all parts of the world. And particularly, there are these kind of chat, uh, voice, text, video talking, sending sticker type of a stuff that for whatever reason has really gained momentum in the Asian market. And we're starting to see some of those uh, functionalities and features bleed into other apps um, that, I, that I equate with more of a US base. Uh, or, or, you know, or certainly Western base. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely interesting to watch some of these trends. You know, Sarah, you said something just a couple of minutes ago that really stuck with me, this whole idea of uh, how things just really change so quickly. And I, I don't know if you find this, but I'm feeling in the social world, especially, uh, I'd hate to necessarily be a developer because I feel like as soon as you develop something and you get that audience, you know, someone develops something even more interesting. And I think we see the same thing with apps, particularly in the messaging place, space that there's just so many, there's so many options and they're just changing so, so fast. It's hard to even keep up. So, uh, um, I don't know. It's just a little thought that I had as far as, uh, you know, not people not sticking to one thing for a long term. And I feel like that's definitely in the future. And, uh, um, I mean, we'll, we're seeing it in other parts of the world. So, so uh, uh, we'll keep an eye on what's happening in the messaging space. And speaking of that, I have a little tip, Sarah. Oh, That's good. About, well, yes, this is for tip away, face, Amber, tip Facebook away. Uh, chat. So uh, I don't know if you do Facebook chats with people, Sarah. Do you oh, have it, your chat turned on? Yeah, I certainly Usually? do. I certainly do. And sometimes, sometimes I'm sitting at my computer minding my own business and Facebook is open. Mm. And, you know, it's obvious that I'm on Facebook because the person on the other side will see the little green dot and I'll start getting into a chat, and it's not really a chat that I want to be in, but I'm sitting there, so I feel obligated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this happens to me all the time, and I, you know, Facebook chat is just one of those things that I tend to uh, not want on very often. However, there's a few people that I wouldn't mind chatting with, particularly relatives of mine who live in different places and I don't get to talk to them all that much. So it's really cool. And I didn't know you could do this. This is uh, a little tip that was on lifehacker.com. You could go into your advanced settings within chat and you can set it up so that you can allow just certain people to be able to see you on chat. So uh, just a handy feature that uh, ensures that if you don't want to chat with the masses, you're able to do that. And you can even kind of go the other way where if you want to be available to everybody, but block a few people, you can do that too. So uh, a handy feature for people who aren't quite sure if they want everybody chatting with them. Oh, I love this. I love this feature. I have no names will be mentioned. I have unfriended people in the past mm. because I felt like, oh, the chat thing is kind of, it's kind of becoming an issue. You know, I'm, oh, I always happen to be working when they want to chat and I just, I, I'm not. It's just bad timing, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, it's not always personal. It's more of a bad timing thing. Sometimes it's personal, I guess. But, you know, there's, there, there are those Facebook friends that you're not really at a chat level and you just prefer that they don't have that access to you, but you don't want to turn off chat completely because I do actually chat uh, with a variety of friends, uh, particularly um, on mobile uh, via uh, Facebook Messenger. So I do think it's a great service. This is a good tip. Yeah, so a simple little tip, very handy. You know, we've got a, we've got a, this is really not very social at all, but hey, we're talking about Google. So, a, you know, Google is a, is a more and more a social company uh, with, with Google Plus, of course. But a new feature in our spotlight of the week called Google Keep. Amber, have you played around with Keep at all? Uh, I haven't played around with it yet, but I'm very familiar with it. I've read every article uh, that's come out on it recently, and uh, I think it's interesting, especially as we talk about the future of Google and some of the uh, tools they have made available. And also, I just got um, a, uh, a Samsung Chromebook, so uh, obviously getting sucked in more and more to the whole Google universe. Yeah, this is uh, this is kind of this is kind of cool. I mean, it's it's uh, it's very much a. Um, as, as many of the headlines say, an Evernote, you know, killer type of a thing. This is uh, at least for the functionality that I've got just at, uh, from my, my Drive account. Uh, by the way, drive.google.com slash keep. If you also have a Google account, I will get you to the same place where I can uh, write some little notes, uh, pick up milk, got to do that. All right, I could, uh, I could, I could color code this, you know, in a particular label. I could add an image if I needed to somehow remember 
that I needed uh, milk and there was an image that would help me. So I'll go ahead and add a picture of my cat because he really likes milk as well. So there's, you've, got, you've got a little bit of functionality here. There's my note, I'm done. Okay, now that's been added. You see my little color code up at the top. There's a, it's kind of hard to see, but you see I'd, I've chosen a sort of a lime green. And that's along with another note that I sent myself yesterday um, when I was pretending that I was sending the first tweet ever. Now, <laughs> at one point, if I, if I start amassing quite a few notes here, and I need to organize them somehow. I can start adding them to particular folders. I can archive them. And then, of course, the, you know, the idea is that because you can access Google Drive from any device, whether I'm on my laptop or a desktop or my, or, or my phone later on, I've got all these notes um, in one place. And the Android experience, of course, is, is going to offer some functionality that I don't have access to using uh, iOS via mobile. But I, I like this. I feel like, Amber, it's funny, when Keep uh, rolled out, and there was there was some talk last week that it was going to, and, and sure enough it did a few days later, a lot of people said, well, what is Google offering that something like Evernote doesn't offer? And I, I don't know if that it, that it is offering anything uh, that's totally revolutionary and different, but it doesn't surprise me that Google would want us to have more of a reason to use yet another helpful Google product. Yeah, you know, I was kind of surprised when they when it came out with this because I was thinking to myself, I guess I haven't thought a lot about Google not having a product like this, this, but it makes perfect sense for them. So I will probably end up using it because I use so many other Google services. I mean, I'm still a huge fan of Evernote and uh, absolutely love that tool. But for Keep, I think, you know, it's going to be one of those tools that's probably going to be around for them for a while. And it was sort of missing out of the uh, their suite of different services that they offer. So uh, keep an eye on that one. Uh, now, Sarah, I have a kind of a weird thing here for our tweet of the week. It's not exactly a tweet because it's an, well, it's an untrue tweet of the week, which uh, I created just for you, Sarah. I sent a screenshot of it earlier on. And uh, it's from a site called Let Me Tweet That For You, which I read about on pointer.org. The site's been out for a while. And uh, the premise is that basically it allows you to create fake tweets. So it looks exactly like someone has tweeted that information, even though they haven't. Uh, now you can find out uh, if the person has tweeted that or not by simply going to their profile on Twitter. Uh, nonetheless, I'm sure that this could potentially uh, cause some mix-ups and problems for people who uh, are kind of trying to have fun with this service and uh, could potentially get people in trouble. Especially because there are plenty of people who use Twitter who are who have a loose understanding of, you know, the, the lexicon and the whole Twitter vernacular and how it all works. And, I mean, there's been the little hack that's been around. It's not a hack, but, you know, it's a little, it's a, it's a fake out that's been around forever where I could say old school RT at Amber Mac and then say whatever I want and make it seem like I retweeted something that you actually said. Now, of course, anybody who goes, whoa, Amber said that, if I said something crazy, could go to your profile and see that no, you didn't actually say anything. What if you deleted it though? Uh, so it's there's there's definitely enough confusion where people are not really fact checking, and we're all busy and we're looking through our streams. And you might go, "Wow, I can't believe Amber said that crazy thing about about Leo Laporte type of a thing." So this seems like just yet another reason for there to be a lot of confusion, and then there to be a lot of uh, you know, if somebody ended up looking like they said something, you know, it's only going to get attention if it's inappropriate, right? Or if it's yeah. outlandish or, or you know, it really grabs people attention, people's attention. And then that initial person has to publicly somehow say, I didn't say that. Here's what happened. And I don't really see this being a good thing at all. It's just no, I don't think so. Yeah, I think it could spread some confusion. I mean, I hope it doesn't really catch on. I, I, I hope that, you know, it's one of those things that people kind of look at and they have some fun with it. It maybe causes, maybe it causes a few problems for some people, but then it just sort of goes away. That, uh, that I think that's wishful, wishful thinking. But uh, uh, anyhow, I mean, I think it's the one of many services out there that uh, could potentially mess with people a little bit and could cause a lot of damage. And but you, and we'll see what happens. You figure that people at Twitter can't be happy about this kind of stuff. I mean, no. this is the problem that Twitter, you really ultimately, Twitter, the company has to figure out how to keep confusion of their many millions of users to a minimum. Uh, the Twitter can be, you know, it's sort of the Wild West out there half the time. Everything's going so fast. People are talking and, you know, some days I can't possibly keep up with my stream. And the last thing I need is to uh, be wondering uh, how, how, 
what percentage of the stuff I'm reading may or may not be fake or fabricated. So, yeah, Twitter, get on that. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the solution is. I guess it's a, it will be happy news if this uh, gets to be more popular for those people who uh, kind of lie and say that their accounts were hacked into. Now they can say, you know what, I think someone's messing with me through services like this. So gives them another uh, scapegoat. Yeah, really. I, I wasn't drunk tweeting. I yeah, that's something else. Yeah. There's all these services out there that are, you know, messing things up and then they'll delete it and um, say someone created using this tool. So uh, perhaps good for some politicians. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the tweet of the week, the non-tweet of the week. Uh, thank you for that, Amber. Hey, want to remind everybody uh, that we love hearing from you, getting getting your uh, your feedback on the show, tips for us, uh, sites that you'd like us to check out, guests that you think that that we should have on the show. It's always so fun. You know, when we were talking to Leo uh, earlier, Leo Leo Siegel, Amber, I thought, gosh, you know, we. Sometimes Amber and I, you know, we, we're perfectly happy just chatting the two of us, but it's so nice to have guests. So uh, the mm. more ideas that you have, the more we'll end up booking the guests that you want us to talk to and asking the questions you want us to ask. So you can write us at the social hour at twit.tv with your feedback. You can also leave us a voicemail at 2626-SOCIAL. Just type in 2626-SOCIAL. You can record a video as well. You could tweet at Amber Mack or Sarah Lane on Twitter. You got all sorts of ways to get a hold of us. And because we had an interview in the show, we didn't really have a whole lot of time to get to our viewer feedback uh, this week. But next week, we'll have even more. So do not fret um, if you've written in. Uh, we, we will get to you. All right, Amber, before we get to our rad or fad for the week, let's take a moment to thank Audible for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. Audible.com is... The number one place by a long shot uh, to, uh, to, to listen to audiobooks. They're the leading provider. You know how many audiobooks they have? You probably do because you hopefully watch the show on a regular basis, and I always tell you, but it's still how really many impressive. Seconds? Over 100,000 titles, all wow. downloadable. I know, it's crazy. All types of literature. You like fiction, they got it. You like nonfiction? That's fine too. Audible's, Audible's the place for you. Periodicals even. And for listeners of The Social Hour, Audible's offering a free audiobook so that you have a chance to try out their service. If you've never played around with audiobooks, there's, there's not much. I mean, you're listening to somebody reading you a book. Sometimes there's more than one person. It's really cool. It's a, every book is different. It's like reading a book. But you're getting read too, and sometimes, at least for people like me, you can do other stuff at the same time. Amber, are you reading anything crazy lately? You know, it's so funny. I just, uh, I literally just bought uh, Lean In by uh -huh. uh, Sheryl Sandberg, and I started it. I'm about maybe 60 pages in right now and uh, really enjoying it. So I was just seeing if it was on Audible, and it looks like it is. Yeah, it sure is. Um, and Cheryl Sandberg is not uh, the narrator. It is narrated by somebody named Eliza Donovan. Internalizing the revolution. Ooh, I like her voice. Very nice. I got pregnant with my first child in the summer of 2004. See, At the time, I was is, running the This is perfect for me. This is like when I'm commuting to and from the brick house, because it's a bit of a commute, this is exactly what I need. And something like Lean In, Amber, I mean, you and I have barely even touched on on on, on the subject until really just now, but this is a hot topic. Um, you know, it is, For men yeah. and women um, worldwide, really, is certainly people who work in the tech industry. So this is this is perfect. I, this, is actually, this is actually a really good pick. I'm glad that you mentioned it. Um, so you could, if you wanted to, you can uh, go ahead and download Lean In, go ahead and select it, and then um, go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour and try out Audible. You get 30 days, just try it out. And then when you sign up for an account, you get to keep that book. So you get a free, you get the free, free book. Yes, perfect. So you get Lean In, you get to hear all about Sheryl Sandberg and how she made it big and how we can all do the same just by leading in a little bit more. Oh, if it was, if it was only that easy. <laughs> so free audiobook. Do you want one? Go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. Get that Get that lean in audiobook or or another audiobook. You know, just 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 start browsing. See what they got there. There's there's definitely a book for you. Um, and once you once you start with audiobooks, I promise you'll get hooked uh, because you'll end up reading a lot more. I guarantee you. At least that's that's how it worked for me. All right, Amber, are you ready? Are you ready for Rad or Fad? Because I am. 
I am ready. Okay, so for Rad or Fad this week, this is a, a very trendy topic to be talking about, which is the topic of smartwatches. So uh, there have been rumors that uh, Apple is building a smartwatch and uh, looks like confirmed rumors that uh, Samsung is doing the same thing. Um, uh, lots of opportunity here to create something that would uh, get people excited. Uh, Samsung recently saying that uh, perhaps the phone market is much too saturated. They want to try something new. And uh, I don't know though, Sarah, I'm really... I'm really not a fan of smartwatches. I think it, we're going to need about five years before they. I will actually ever wear one. Now, do, do, you, you, feel? do you wear a watch in general? I do, yes. Okay. I always wear a watch. Um, it's just that this, I've seen some smartwatches, and they're always so unattractive. I think for they're mostly made for men. I think that's the first run that they're, they're made for men um, in particular. And so as a woman, I just haven't seen anything that I would ever wear. I, so who knows? The, the thing, the the smartwatch thing, it, it's gone out of control, hasn't it? And and it has. the, the great thing about it is, is that it's not as if there are all these smartwatches on the market. We're just talking about them. Yeah, there mm -hmm. was a rumor that Apple was coming out with some sort of an iWatch, and then it's like, oh, Samsung's making a, a smartwatch too. So it's not just Apple. We're on it. Then LG is like, well, we're making a smartwatch. And then there's a rumor that Google's working on its own smartwatch, which has nothing to do with the Samsung smartwatch, even though Google and Samsung have a pretty good relationship when it comes to Android. It's like, okay, well, where are all of these, and are they going to be any good, and is it just going to be this silly trend where they initially sell a bunch and people wear them and then they stop wearing them. Now, Amber, the watch that you have on, I mean, it's, it's, it's a nice watch. I mean, it's, it's sort of like jewelry, plus you can tell time. But we were talking about this on TNT uh, today, actually, where it's like, but these smart watches, the whole thing is like, you almost, they're almost not watches anymore. It's like, yeah, they'll tell time, but they're designed to do a bunch of other stuff, right? It's not mm -hmm. just some sort of a watch that Apple made. And so the whole thing feels very silly to me. I mean, why are we all getting all bent out of shape about who's going to have the best watch? It's like, it's this weird industry that no one's really talked about for a while. And probably a lot of people have stopped wearing watches because we've got our mobile phones usually tucked in our pocket or pretty close to us. It's, it's like a, it's, it's a watch frenzy. It is a watch frenzy. And I say, Sarah, it is a big fat fad right now. I'm not saying in a few years that this will not be popular, but uh, I just, I, I, based on what I've seen being developed right now, and I'm, there are lots of Kickstarter campaigns as well to uh, try to do similar things. I just, I think we're a few years away from anything like this being uh, a, a popular trend. And I think as much as we want to talk about it, I just don't think we're there yet. And uh, I just don't necessarily think this is the future of computing. Yeah, That's my stance. I... I agree. It's the thing is, is, and 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 I am excited to see what gets imagined. There's the Pebble Watch that uh, was the Kickstarter project that uh, you know I, I've actually seen a couple of Pebble watches out in the wild. You know, I look at it and the face is small, so you've got you've just got a limited area to work with, you know, to put data into that's going to be interesting for me to read. And you kind of go like, okay, and I sort of think, well, it's a little bit like. I don't know, that iPod Nano that was really, really, really small that could be used as a watch. I get it, but yeah, I just don't feel, Amber, like the masses are, you know, everyone wants a watch so badly that finally we're all gonna get the perfect product and it's just a matter of who makes the perfect product. I think a lot of people will sort of go, I don't know, are we, are we all supposed to be wearing computer watches now? Okay. Are they going to have to be paired via, you know, Bluetooth or something to some other device? That's just adding to my device collection. That's not really something I'm looking to do either. Yeah, me neither. I, I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of this trend. I don't think it's going away anytime soon, but uh, I think it's one of those fads for 2013 that I could absolutely live without. Yeah, me too. Me too. That said, that said, I will, I will admit I was at Nordstrom to... It's a department store a couple days ago, and I found myself in the jewelry slash watch section, section, and I thought, gosh, you know, I just really haven't looked at watches in a long time. I guess I got watch on the brain, and I'm looking at all these beautiful watches and thinking, maybe I should see what comes out this year first. Oh, boy. <laughs> Before I buy myself a nice watch, kind of like the one that you're wearing, because who knows, maybe I'll regret getting myself a nice fancy watch, because then Apple or Samsung will have this really beautiful watch that I wish I would have waited six months for. I don't know. I don't know. So I'm... But you, like, the thing is, uh, th like, with a phone, right? I mean, I think you can build a phone that's good for both 
women and men. Right. I don't think you can do the same thing for a watch. So I see them coming out with this first run of watches and there's no way they're going to be like, oh, this will fit a man and fit a woman. It's not, you know, our wrists are very different sizes <laughs> for the most part. And I just, it's, they're just going to be a long way off and there's going to be bulky and ugly to start with. That's why, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I think you could buy yourself a watch and you'll be okay for a few years. I think so too. Jax Crow so. in, in chat says, I would rather wear ugly Google Glass than a giant watch or a small one with a fairly useless display. I don't know, man. I have been seeing some Google Glass around these days. I called them Google Glasses this morning and everybody jumped on me. Pretty honest mistake, you have to admit. But uh, <laughs> they're not very cute either. They're very distracting. I mean, if someone's wearing Google Glass, that's all I am looking at. I don't know what color their eyes are or if they have a beautiful smile. All I can see are those silly glasses. They've really got to work <laughs> on the look of those, but that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> That'll be for next week. <laughs> yeah. We'll get into fashionable Google Glass on the next edition of the Social Hour. Well, speaking of next week, Amber, we've actually come to the end of our hour. We're almost right on the dot. So that is it, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. It has been fun. Uh, remember that we're live on Fridays at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Amber and I love doing the show. It's perfect Friday afternoon. We've got the whole week. We, you know, we can sort of look at what happened in social this week and, and, uh, and lead into our weekend having a little fun um, and talking about all this stuff with all of you. So thanks to everybody who watches and listens each week. And remember, if you can't watch us live, that's cool. We're on demand too. Uh, we've got video and audio feeds. Twit.tv slash TSH is where you can keep up with our show, watch past episodes, subscribe to future ones. And uh, Amber, do you have anything exciting going on uh, in the week until, until we meet again? I'm trying to think. Ah, uh, I don't think so. I know I have a kind of a busy week next week, but it's a short week because uh, I don't know about where you are, but it is a holiday on Friday, next Friday for Easter weekend, I think, if I'm right. We, uh, is, is that it, next week? Oh, gosh, is it Good Friday? We don't get it yes. off. Um, but, uh, okay. Well, our, well, I hope that, uh, I don't know, do you feel like working on your day off? <laughs> oh, that's fine. Yeah, it is a stat holiday here, but it's, yeah, it's fine. I'll be on the show next Friday. But oh, good. I may have eaten a lot of uh, chocolate candy for Easter. Who knows? Perfect. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll eat some chocolate bunnies. We're going to have a lot of viewer feedback. It's going to be a very good day. Wonderful. Everything is going to be great about it. All right, well, thanks for joining us, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next week on The Social Hour.